Hi, good afternoon. Um, it's always a kind of tough gig to be the last speaker before the free wine reception. I know, but um, I'm going to try and finish at five. So yeah, I, so, so I actually work, I work on the Board of Longitude Project, um, but I work for Cambridge Digital Library, which is, um, I was going to say the unified digital humanities platform for Cambridge, but I can't say that because Alison's here <laughs> and Mike, so it's one of the unified um, digital humanities platforms for Cambridge University, um, run from the university library, but taking in material and projects from both within and outside Cambridge, of which the Board of Longitude was one. Um, so the Board of Longitude project finished about 18 months ago, but it was um, a very successful project for us, which um, I keep getting invited to speak about the Board of Longitude project. And I really like that project, so I'm very happy about it. I've eaten so many free biscuits <laughs> um, and drunk a lot of free wine off the back of this project. Um, so the project was to digitize, describe, and put online the complete archive of the Board of Longitude. Um, one of the things I'd like to concentrate on today is that the project was a partnership with an existing AHRC-funded research project based at um, the HPS in Cambridge and led by Simon Schaffer, who some of you might know, um, and the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich. So it was, it was a partnership between a big library, big research project, and a big museum. And I think that, that's very interesting, and it's something I'll come back to later. Um, it was the biggest project we'd ever over undertaken in the university library, 65,000 images. Um, this is interesting, 100,000 words of contextual material alongside the images, which was provided by, not by librarians, but by the researchers. So that's the equivalent, apparently, of a big hardback book, which they wrote, and they didn't publish it as a book, they published it alongside the images on the site. So that was quite a new model for them, quite a new model for us, and that was exciting. Um, over 100 detailed archival records, so um, that was the library's contribution. We took the images, we provided the basic archival data, the academics stuck there a bit on top. Though there was actually a surprising amount of backwards and forwards in between the arch archivists and the academics as they found out new things about the archive, so that was exciting too. Um, and then schools resources, contextual essays, and three short films, and a conference which was filmed and is available on YouTube. Um, the project involved over 20 people, probably many more than 20 people, but 20 people kind of formally. It was um, three years, it took a lot of organisation, and it was a big success for us. So I'm not going to quote our project um, report um, where I wrote a paragraph on how great it was. So it says, since launch in July 2013, the Longitude Collection on Cambridge Digital Library has attracted more than 70,000 visitors from all over the world. And what, one of the interesting things about the, the library's collection, which I'm sure is the same for lots of memory institutions' collections, is that the, the material has been gathered in over hundreds of years from all over the world, and then it's been held kind of centrally in a place where not very many people can see it. And that by digitising the stuff and putting it online and making it freely available on the internet, there's a kind of idea that you're... Re not exactly repatriating the material, but at least allowing cultures who have interest in the material access to the material again, which is a very good thing. Sorry, I got distracted there. Um, and a further 10,000 views on our specially commissioned short films on YouTube. Before this project, I should say, the idea of putting a film on YouTube would have been a complete anathema to the university library. It didn't, like, didn't really like to think about things like YouTube or films, cartoons, as they were called in one meeting. Why are we producing cartoons and putting them on YouTube? We're a serious library. I'm going to show you one of the cartoons in a minute, and they're, they're really good. So. Well, I think they're good. Um, social media feedback points to the breadth of the online audience. I've got an example of that in a minute. From academic researchers through to family historians and students. So one of the things we're trying to do is not only um, increase the numbers on the site, but increase the types of people, so to, to broaden um, the audience for this kind of material. I think that lots of material which was originally produced by people who aren't academics has become the preserve of academics due to the places where they're held, which is places where, unless you're an academic, you don't get in. So it's very interesting for us to see. So in the Longitude archive, there's lots of material produced by engineers and um, 
artisans. And then when you open up that material back to engineers and artisans, kind of pra pragmatic engineers and artisans, you get um, a range of opinions on it and a new insight on it, which is just as valid as the academic thing. And in a sense, it kind of closes the circle. Um, uh, through to family historians and students. There's been ongoing media interest in the online collection, which, has been which was featured by BBC, Times, Guardian, and Telegraph, amongst others, and highlighted on the popular BBC programme, Coast. So that was, um, that was great for us. We've never, the library has never been on Coast before, I don't think. The uh, PI and the project Simon Schaffer went out in a boat to try out one of the crazy longitude inventions. And he almost sank, which I predicted. I said, Simon, if you go on that boat, you're going to sink. They were forced back into port by a force six scale on the Bristol Channel. And then they had to film it at Greenwich instead. Um, um, and the collection, and I think this is also important, the collection also achieved a very high profile in the university and appeared on the front page of the university's, the whole university's annual report for 2014 amongst a handful of selected achievements across the whole institution. I think high profile within your own institution for digitization, digitization is often seen as kind of marginal at the side thing in institutions, particularly in places like the University Library. I'm sure that the, those of you who know the University Library will know what I'm talking about. And in a sense, by, it's only by achieving a high profile in your own institution that you can kind of move to the center and start to do some more exciting things with digitization. So there's that kind of, you have to make the case outside, and then your vice chancellor is watching Coast, and he says, what's this? I'd better put this on the front page of the annual report. So and that then makes it made our life a lot. Um, easier. So today, very quickly, I'm going to give some background on the archive itself. Actually, I'm not going to. I'm just going to play the video. Um, then a brief demo of the website, demonstrating some of the features and some of the material. And I'm going to finally talk about this thing, the, the most interesting aspect of the project to us, one of the key reasons for its success, which was a project as a partnership. And I'm hoping that this is going to work. Otherwise, otherwise we can just go and drink the wine. <laughs> is it going to? The Board of Longitude Archive is an outstanding record of 18th and 19th centuries. I should say that it sounds like Brian Cox. It isn't Brian Cox. We couldn't afford <laughs> him, but we got somebody who sounded like him, which was clever. <laughs> Cambridge University Library and Royal Museums Greenwich have digitised the entire archive, making everything available online for the first time. Cambridge University Library and Royal Museums Greenwich They, as they animated it, sorry to break into the video, they used a lot of materials from the archive. So that was, so you're actually seeing the archive. I think lots of people try and make people come to your site and see things under your terms, as it were. But by putting it on YouTube as a kind of cartoony format, loads of people saw, you know, the original materials from the archive, which is just as good. Meanwhile, John Hansen works to create a more accurate timekeeper. Clocks have been reliable enough until then, but after 30 years of working with the board, Harrison made a watch that can help time long in the sea. The board documented their progress towards this and their other work, creating a vast archive. The papers record scientific endeavor, pioneering exploration, faithful voyages, and lifetimes of commitment to a common cause. Okay, so that's, that's the... And I, I should just reiterate that um, I wasn't just being lazy playing that. that you know, I was being sideways. I think that, you know, that's... As I said, it's not something that the library really would have ever done in the past. It's not something... And I'll come on to this in a minute, but working with other institutions... So, so the museum sector is incredibly on to outreach 
and doing things like this. And they essentially convinced us to be much more open and put stuff on YouTube and get into these kind of cartoons. And they said, yeah, you should do this. And we were like, no, we don't want to. Don't make us do it. And we did. And it was great. And, and I think we got, as well as the 70,000 people on the site, I think we've had well over 10,000 people watching the films and then coming to the site. Anyway, so to get to the site, so the point of the site is that an a interested person, a school child who's just come back from a lesson on Captain Cook types, Captain Cook logbook into Google, and then now, now we've put it online, the first hit is the logbook of HMS resolution, and if you click on it, then, so that's Google search, one click, and then there, I'll just find a more interesting thing, they're looking at massive Zooming images of the Captain Cooks. Oh, do I? No, no. <laughs> of um, of the logbook of the resolution, which is something that up until we put it online, probably a handful of people had seen since it arrived at the library in 1940. So that's really the the kind of key to what we're trying to do with the digital library to to make it kind of present. Take these incredibly rare. An incredibly, um, you know, underused documents. Digitize them, take these. I mean, I, I hope you can see that the quality of, of these images. Something weird has happened with this mouse. But um, if I zoom out, so this map is actually, sorry, this mouse is a bit strange. <laughs> but I will try to negotiate. So this map is actually about this big. And you can zoom into incredible. Whoa, incredible definitions, if the thing works, which it doesn't. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm not quite sure what's happening. Uh, <laughs> come, back. come back. Anyway, right, OK. So, um, so, what, so our basic presentation is that you can, you can page through and read the book. Um, there are 100 items on the, uh, on the Board of Longitude. Um, the Board of Longitude is part of the, of the site. They've all, everything on digital library has got exactly the same layout. So when you arrive, you kind of know what you're doing. And that's big zooming image on the left-hand side as you look at it. And then on the right-hand side, kind of tool information about the thing and tools about how to use the thing and how to navigate it. So um, if I go to about. So this is, the, this is the contribution of the researchers. So for every single, each one of the 100 items um, that the collection is made up of, there's approximately a thousand word essay written by one of the researchers. And I think this is a very important point. They put their name to it just like an academic article. So they're publishing directly to the site alongside the primary resource. And I think that that's kind of proved a very powerful model for us. Um, the advantage of doing it online is that when something's described in the description, as it were. So, inhabitants of Tonga. This is the description of the inhabitants of Tonga. I wish it would stop doing this. <laughs> um, maybe I'll just open a new tab and go back in. I think I clicked something weird. And so, so when something's described on this this side of the page, then you go to the page with the description on it. So. Let's have a look at islands, include a map of Palace's Islands. and you're, So you can either choose to read the book or you can read it through the academic, the kind of expert opinion on the right-hand side. Um, so again, when something's described, there we go. Here's some incident um, from the log, and there it is. And then we have contents. So this is where the archive record comes into play, so this is the structured the structured information from the archive, so a map of King George's Islands. Again, apparently, I'm told by Simon that because of the, um, the high resolution of the image, you can see much more than you can with the naked eye. And he's found out a lot about how these documents were constructed um, and how people drew maps in that period just by looking at the markings, and he can see that they were tracing and over-tracing, apparently. And so so the, in, in some senses, the digitized versions are better than using the, um, I know it's heresy, but, or, <laughs> or, or uh, useful to be used alongside the, um, 
And again, log in is January. Okay, so, so that's a log book. If we go back then, so, so the idea is that each, each volume is kind of independently usable, and you can just come in straight from the net if you want to. We do also have a home page where you can go and browse the collection. So here's the Board of Longitude home page. And I'm just going to take you through um, a couple of other. So here's a, another volume which contains a letter from Bly, Bly of Muti of the Bounty fame, apologizing for the loss of his timekeeper. On, uh, on board the bounty. He doesn't really apologize very well, Bly. He just, I am to inform you that the timekeeper, which was given to my challenge, Bly de Bly, was left in the said ship by me <laughs> when pirated <laughs> from my command. And, and so, so we have correspondence. So we've got lots of correspondence. That's just one. We've got thousands and thousands of pages of correspondence. Um, I'm going to allow you to do that. Um, and again, this is another volume, so you can see that exactly the same thing. Somebody else wrote, another one of the researchers wrote this essay. And, you know, again, it's highly linked through. Um, one thing I haven't shown is that the National Maritime Museum um, have their own collections online, so where something is described on our site, then there's a link through to their site as well. So we're bringing back together these... Um, the artifacts and the, um, the documents. And then if I just go back here again. Um, and then the, the, uh, the submissions to the, to the board themselves. So here's a model, a movable model, which was featured in the film. And then if you just page through, you can see that, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages of these things. Well, I think the internet's starting to catch up. So, so that's, like, that's a quick tour of what the site is. So it's um, 100 volumes, pretty big. Each one's got an academic um, writing an essay on it, and you can navigate through um, using the essay. So I'm just going to quickly talk in the next six about, about the partnership side of the project. So as I said, the, um, it was a partnership between a research project, a library, and a museum. It was, quickly became apparent that these are very different worlds and they have very different priorities. So the, the research side, their direct contribution was obviously this 100,000 words of content onto the site. Um, of contextual material, transcription, they transcribed the, 1,000 pages of transcription. We transcribed the board's minutes to act as a kind of map through to the rest of the collection. It took a very long time. A thousand pages of transcription takes a long time. One guy got RSI, it was, like, it was a bit dreadful. So we know that transcription is hard work. Um, but I think that, that you know, beyond their, their direct contribution to the site, I think that this thing of work, working very closely alongside in a formal project with some of our biggest consumers meant that we were able to get feedback on how the site should look while the site was in development. So I think that's, that's one really important thing about having projects which, which go outside of your own institution, the library side and the academic side. The second thing was that, that we got the links into academic networks by working alongside um, the research project, which are very difficult to do if you're just working as a library. It's by the time the, th this project um, came out, everybody in the history of science world who had an interest in longitude and all of their students and all of their students' friends and their mums and their dads, they all knew that this was coming and then when it came out they all like, fell on it and used it and started to use it as a teaching tool. And as a library we would have never been able to, and then that generated the whole kind of thing, you know, use drives further use. As a library we would have never on our own been able to get into those academic networks and drive that kind of use. Um, so that was the, our partnership with our partnership with the um, with the research project. And on the museum side, um, I think that you know, as I said, the, the museums I think are miles ahead of libraries in terms of their the, the importance they place on outreach and on engagement with their users, and also on. I think libraries have this thing of like we'll put it there, and if you if you know how to use it, you're qualified to use it, and if you know it's there, you're qualified to see it, but we're not going to kind of push out to you. You have to come and ask us, and then we'll all we give you is the thing. They're not into providing context, usually, around their, 
around their collections. Museums, of course, that's one of their big things and has been for quite a long time, this idea of providing context. So you can use this resource in teaching. You can use this resource. You know, here's, here's a, a YouTube video with lots of things from this resource. So we had the kind of academic, you know, basis, the high quality images, but then we had the museum helping us to push things out as well, which was very, very useful for us. But um, I very quickly like to talk about the library's role as a partner in this project. Um, and I think that if I go back to the digital library homepage, so it's not just the Board of Longitude project on digital library. The Board of Longitude is one of, what now, 14 or 15? Um, projects. So we've got Newton, we've got Darwin, we've got Secret Soon, things about the Battle of Waterloo, blah, blah, blah. So, so I think, you know, it's well recognized that one of the big problems for digital humanities projects was that um, they built websites which were kind of individual and just for their project. And at the end of the project, the funding runs out, and two years later, the website is dead. I think that one of the roles that libraries can take in this, like in the digital humanities um, what's the name, sphere, is to, so libraries have a kind of long-term commitment to running systems for a long time, to looking after things for a long time, and to taking that kind of responsible long-term future, which, which academic projects, due to the nature of their funding and due to the nature of kind of academics moving from one thing to another, find it very difficult to do. And I think that, you know, the library, basically the library has by the time the project had started, the library had already invested a lot of time and money in developing this platform. So the digital library pre-existed the, um, the project. And then we just put it up on there. There was very little development at all, apart from tweaks which the academics asked for involved in putting the project up. So we just said, yeah, th they came to us, we said, yeah, we have a platform for putting description, images, whole thing, making it searchable, making it available to the web, and you don't really have to worry about that, much like with your just giving the images and descriptions to the, is it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. so you're doing the same thing in a sense, you're not building a site yourself you're th saying, right, we have somebody who does that well, we do this well, we do the descriptions well we'll do that That's we've got somebody who provide, already provides a stable platform, so let's not build one of those, let's just provide it to there and it's the same, I think, with um, our partnership with the academics. We didn't try to write academic descriptions of our stuff. We, st we did the archival stuff. We're very good at the images, so we did that. And then we, we asked, got, you know, got into it with the academics who provided. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is that I think there was a time in digital humanities when groups were given a bit of funding and they tried to do everything themselves. And I think that that probably that now is changing into into projects being partnerships with people. So you, you bring together two or three institutions who are already specialists and already have existing tools in the area, in the area that you want to, you want to do it. So, so as a digital library, we, we reach out to academics and say, you've got an interest in some of that material. Reach out to other project partners, say the museum, you've got material which is related to our things. Let's go in together and push a project through. And I think that that was why, partly why the Longitude project was so much fun, because we got to go around and meet all kinds of different people who, you know, spend time on the academic side, on the museum side. And I think, but also, that's the kind of reason for its success, that it was a kind of, that blend of experts and networks, as they say, you know, kind of, you, you don't try and do everything yourself, you go and, like, find people who are already good at it. But yes, okay, and that was, that was it. Thanks. <laughs>